and gentlemen, welcome to the Insiders Edge podcast here on the WCWA Network. I'm your host with the most on the West Coast, California and Fury. It's a joy to be with you all once again here for episode 163 of the podcast. And right here, right now, I have the opportunity to speak to a legend from the pro wrestling business. I've been I've been bugging him about this for a long time now, and I finally got him on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the one. Here's the only. Pitbull, Gary Wolf, how are you, sir? Good, good. How's it going, brother? Pitbull from the Pitbulls. Uh, just so you know, I don't know if your fans realize this, but I used to live in Australia. I lived in Melbourne, Australia, which me and my partner held <clears throat> the tag team titles multiple times in Australia. Very cool. How long ago was that, Gary? Uh, I was... Uh, Probably in the 2000s, but we were called. We were working for a Hardcore Championship Wrestling out of Melbourne, right? And uh, it was a very successful show. <clears throat> we were pulling 13s. I don't know why we went out of business, but we were there for almost a year total. Wow, very cool. Well, that's that's nice to hear, Gary. They have a, a bit of a, a past here with our country, and uh, you know, speaking of the past, I always ask this question every time I have someone on the show. When you were a young man, there, there must have been a, a moment in time where you became a fan of pro wrestling and the bug bit you. What was that moment that made you realize you wanted to get into the wrestling business? Uh, I loved superstar Billy Graham. I loved Jimmy Snooker coming off the top of the cage, hitting Don Morocco in the middle of the ring. Uh, I think that was the moment. I wanted to be a wrestler, but didn't think it was possible, you know, because those guys were so big back then. Right, of course. I think that splash from Snooker on Morocco uh, was the moment for a lot of people, it seems. Um, so that moment happens. You do eventually get into the wrestling business. Sorry to skim forward so much here because I, I'm really excited to ask you about 1989. Uh, between February and August of that year, yourself and your partner, Anthony, you worked four tag matches uh, with the WWF, the Hart Foundation, Twin Towers, Brain Busters, and the Rougeaus. Uh, you and uh, Johnny Hotbody also wrestled the Powers of Pain. And you also got to work with Barry Windham and Ted DiBiase. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about this learning experience for you uh, this early in your career? Yeah, Vince called us up and wanted us to come in and uh, get some practice and experience. So we were like, you know, absolutely, you know, let's go. You know, and once we got there and got in the ring with the Hearts and many other teams like the Big Boss Man and Akeem, we wrestled every single tag team there, every single one. Because we would go a multiple of 10 different cities, we would meet them, total of. And uh, it helped us out a lot because that's when I realized, wait a minute, this is how you work. You know, we're in school beating the shit out of each other, not realizing you know, these guys are wrestling six nights a week. And now I know why they could wrestle six nights a week because it, it's called a work. You know, it's a business. And uh, it just gave us a lot of experience. It also gave us a lot of uh, connections. Uh, we were very young, but the boys like loved us. I mean, we just got along good with everybody. Uh, I'll give you one quick story about the Ted DiBiase match. Uh, he's a very big man. You know what I mean? I don't think you realize that. Most people don't realize that until you see him in person. And uh, of course, the butterflies were flowing. It's in front of 32,000 people. And, you know, I had, had to go to the bathroom, man, and I didn't have time to go to the bathroom. So I got in the ring with Ted DiBiase, and he gave me one little spot to do just to, you know, give me something to do. It was a sunset flip from the outside to the inside, went for the cover, but I didn't let him go. I held him down as hard as I could on purpose because I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to mess with him like they all messed with us. You know what I mean? Because we were young. And uh, I held him down pretty hard, man. And he kicked out and he had to use everything he got to kick out. Got up and clotheslined me right across my face. <laughs> and when he did it, it sh I, I fucking shit my pants. <laughs> so... I mean, it was no joke. I mean, I went in the back. I had to throw my tights away, and he came in the back of Vince's locker room, and he was rubbing his face, you know, like this, and yawning, and 
You know, he was waiting for me to complain and bitch. Never did it. Never said anything. But thank you, sir. I appreciate it. You know, and he was like, that was kind of funny what you did there. I said, well, you gave me a receipt back because I don't know if you realize it, but you hit me so hard I shit my pants <laughs> so he was smiling and laughing afterwards and he was very cool because long as I didn't complain and bitch that's all he cared about and uh, I took it like a guy a man and and I was very young we were like 19 20 years old if that me and my partner so we were very very young and uh, like I said we kept our mouth shut and uh, we ended up working for Vince between 88 and 89 you know, right. so for about a good two years. Very cool. Very cool. Love the story there, Gary. And uh, another thing I wanted to ask you about here as we move into 1990, uh, you work at a company called South Atlantic Pro Wrestling. Um, I noticed yourself and Anthony, uh, you were known as the American Bulldogs as well as the American Pitbulls. Uh, but I always have to ask any tag team uh, member who worked with the Nasty Boys. Um, it seems you worked with the Nasty Boys quite a lot there. I just want to see if you have any nasty boys stories because we always seem to get quite a lot on the show here. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, the nasties got us one night good. They put hot stuff in our tights. So we're, we're in the ring wrestling and, you know, within 10, 15 minutes of being in that ring and sweat, uh, you could imagine the pain we were in. I mean, it was no joke. I mean, it was funny to them because they thought it was funny, but when you got uh, icy hot down there near your testicles, bro, it's the hot. It, it's painful. I'm talking, I was almost crying. That's how bad it hurt. And I remember my partner got so pissed that he picked up each guy, nine sags, like a body slam, but instead shut through them head first. And all you could hear is the nasty boys going, what the fuck? What the fuck? You know, like they didn't under, like, they were like, you're killed. You're going to break our necks, you know? But we didn't give a shit at that point. We were so mad at them for doing that. I mean, and it was a common rib, but it just hurt so bad. Uh, and then what we did two days later is we had TV tapings and we asked Paul Jones and George Scott if we could do a heel promo because we were baby faces at the time. And uh, they would never let us do it. I mean, they would never let us do it. And finally, I mean, after months and months and months, he's like, okay, you could do one promo and let's see how you guys do. We cut the promo and they, they, their draw was on the ground. I mean, they, they looked at me and my partner and said, you guys are natural heels. There's no doubt about it. What the fuck are we going to do now? Because we have to change everything. So we ended up getting back at the nasty boys by making them baby faces. And we became <laughs> the heels. And they threw, they, they, they threw us right in the stud stable and they threw us uh, with uh, Matt Bourne and, and, and Robert Fuller and the U.S. Mail. And they turned us into the, the Pit Bulldogs, which Robert Fuller named us. And we were stone heels. And that's when everything went to cra everything went crazy after that. We got the belts. That's when New Japan started looking into us. And after we turned heel, that's when everything went crazy. and We just loved it. Excellent stuff there. I love how just a, a random story of Icy Hot ended up leading to all of this craziness taking place. And um, as you said, things going crazy. One thing I wanted to ask you about, because this tends to happen when I do my research and seek out any sort of random things from someone's career. Um, the research can be wrong, but I wanted to throw this one at you. 3rd of March, 1991. It's a WCW house show at the Convention Center in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Apparently, you team with Sid Vicious against the Steiner Brothers. Is this true? Yeah. Uh, Anthony, <clears throat> sorry. Anthony ended up wrestling Matt Bourne, who was Josh, I guess, something. Uh, he was like a lumberjack or something. Uh, big Josh. Uh, they brought, they called us up. Yeah, they just, WCW called us up and just said, come to the Spectrum in Atlantic City. We want to use you guys. And uh, they took me up with Sid Vicious against the Steiners, which was awesome. They had a great match. We did about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and then, like I said, Anthony ended up working uh, Big Josh, who was uh, Matt Bourne at the time. And uh, it was good. You know, we, we ran into Flair again. We ran into all our boys that we we're friends with. And 
it was really nice seeing everybody again. And uh, it was a good payday and we didn't have nothing. We had no problem with it, you know. Excellent. Yes, I just wanted to make sure that that was correct. And, uh, you know, I got the story as well. So very cool. Um, so, uh, yes, you did mention uh, time in Japan, New Japan Pro Wrestling, uh, you know, uh, starting from, I believe, 91 going into 92. You get to work with Liger, Fujinami, Masa Saito, uh, Chono. There had to be a, a lot of learning experience again here, like when you were working earlier in the WWF in 88 and 89. Can you tell me a little bit about that learning experience? Yeah, WF was more American style and it was very easy, you know what I mean? Very, very light. Uh, when I got to Japan, I had to learn strong style, which was more rough, very stiff. Uh, back in them days, New Japan was no joke. I mean, we were literally beating the shit out of each other. Uh, I heard it's a lot easier now, which I understand. I mean, believe me. If you would have seen the guys getting hurt back in them days, you would you would know why, you know, because it was was very rough, very rough. And I would do if we had a three week tour, that's 21 days, we would work 18 at them 21 days. So that's a rough tour, you know, and then some nights, like I said, you know, out of a three week tour, I, I would say eight of them matches. I would be wrestling singles, you know, that either be Chono. Master Chono, Master Saito, uh, uh, Tiger Jet Singh was another guy that's an old timer that was there. Kung Lee is another old timer that was there. And he, you got to remember, these guys are all silver and gold and bronze medalists in the Olympics. Yeah. You know, so getting in the ring with these guys taught us a lot of it, gave us a lot of experience. And we realized you can't be a pussy in Japan. And we realized that very quick because uh, if, you know, if they know you are and think you are, they're going to take full advantage of it. So uh, we, we got our shit together, and uh, they actually called us the Mad Bull Busters in Japan because we I owned and trademarked the Pitbull's name in 1988. So even though Mad Bull Buster to them meant Pitbull, it was still their name, you know, and it was okay. I had the problem with that. But it was great experience working the Malinkos, working Benoit, Jericho, Eddie Guerrero, Sabu. I mean, we would we would go with all those guys. That was our clique. Owen Hart, you know, all those guys. That's incredible. Um, so again, uh, obviously, it's time to me for me to be talking to you about ECW. There is a brief run that uh, yourself and Anthony have there uh, in Eastern Championship Wrestling in '92, um, but then. I wanted to bring up this uh, your televised debut as the Pitbull on the 26th of December 93 at Holiday Hell. You wrestle against Chad Austin. I watched this match earlier today. Huge showing. You immediately impress in front of that tough Philly crowd. There is a surprise loss. You beat the piss out of him after the match. Sandman makes the save. Jason gets involved. You beat the piss out of Sandman. What a first impression. How did you feel about, you know, your kind of your re-debut in ECW here in late 93? Well, just so you know, I started in ECW when it was Tri-State Wrestling Alliance, which was the late 80s. We were already in. Uh, Todd Gordon already signed us because we were already going to Japan. So there wasn't much for him to think about except signing us immediately. So we had the belts, we were getting, we had the tag team belts there when it was Tri-State, which was a long time ago. Then it turned into Eastern. Uh, that's when we started going to Japan. And I happened to be home one night, uh, it was around 93. I came back from a tour, I had to get knee surgery, so I had to get that done. So I was just sitting on my mom's couch one night at 2.30 in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, and I see ECW pop up on TV. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? And then I see Sandman on air, who was a friend of mine that I met before I went to Japan. He was a fan in the stands. He didn't know. He was just a fan. And he wanted to be a wrestler. So I told him, you know, at that point, I said, go to Joel Goodhart's school, who was partners with Todd Gordon. And it was called Eastern Championship Wrestling. When I got back, I found out he went, <laughs> passed tremendously well, and uh, he was called the Sandman at that point. He had the surfboard and the wetsuit, and 
I was just like, holy shit, you know, so I called Todd Gordon, who was my agent anyway, and I said, I want to get back, you know, I'm doing Japan, but I have nothing going on in the States, you know, and he's like, all right, well, how do you feel? I said, I'm 100%. He's like, we'll show up at the building. So I showed up at the arena, and uh, Paul saw me, liked me. I worked that night. Uh, I think I was there maybe four or five more weekends. And every weekend I showed up bigger, 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 badder, meaner. And by the fifth time, uh, I remember he told me, he said, what are you doing this week? I said, nothing. He goes, okay, well, I need you to come to New York and cut some promos. And he never saw my promos. He, he couldn't, you don't even know if I was able to cut a promo. So, you know, we, uh, I went there and, that's when, you know, he's like, I'm going to put you in a match against JT Smith for the TV title. And, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. In the beginning, I told him I didn't want the belt. You know, I was not thinking straight. I didn't want the belt. That's what I said, because my partner was in Germany still. And I was waiting for Anthony to come home. He was working for Otto. And uh, when he got home, that's when, we, you know, Paul was like, yeah, as soon as he gets back, you know, he, he comes here. We tag you guys up. So why don't you run with the TV title for a little bit, you know, and I, and I'm very glad that I changed my mind and I decided yes, because if you look at that group of guys who all held that television belt, it's unbelievable. You know, you got Jericho to Eddie Guerrero, to Dean Malenko, to Shane Douglas, to Sabu, to Rob Van Dam. I mean, you, I can go through the names, but I'm only going to go through about 20 of them. And, and even my partner held that TV title. So I don't care what anybody says, that was the number one TV title in wrestling history, I think and feel. You know what? I'd have to agree with that because uh, it really was like the workhorse championship. Whoever had that belt was, you know, pretty much the best in the company um and that's not a knock on the heavyweight title but um it really did mean, no, I mean it was an hour tv show i would have 20 minutes of that show because i was the television champion and that's what was so good about it was if you had the skill on the mic you could hold that belt and then the skill in the ring just went with it you know what i'm saying and like I said, it was one of the best decisions that I made was to get that bill. This way I'm in that clique, I'm in that group of guys in history that had that, that held that title. Yeah, of course. You should be very proud of that. You should look back on it very fondly. And and obviously you also look back very fondly on your time with the Pitbulls in ECW with Anthony. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the teams that you had worked with, but there was one team that, it just feels like when I was looking through doing my research, you didn't really get the chance to work with them a whole lot. You worked a different uh, array of combinations of the Dudley boys, but of course the main duo of Bubba Ray and Devon is kind of like the dream match there you're thinking of. Uh, why did you only face that combination once at ECW Hostile City Showdown 96 to a no contest? Why was there no more uh, stuff between Bubba Ray and Devon and the Pitbulls? Uh, at that time, I'm not going to lie, I personally was going through my injury time. <laughs> so it seemed like every other month something was happening. You know what I mean? Every every wrestler goes through that. Uh, every time we had the straps, we would have to drop them because either I would get injured or, or something else would happen. And, uh, you know, we had them three or four different times, but we had to drop them right away because I had to go get surgery like if I blew my bicep or tricep, I didn't care. I'm not going to walk around with a tour tricep or a, bi a bicep. I'm going to get it fixed. And it only took me out six weeks. Uh, it was okay. You know what I mean? But like I said, I had a couple injuries here and there, and that's what made us win the belts and then drop them right away. And we would normally, you know, drop them right to the Dudleys. And uh, it just so happened, you know, the, re the way this business is, I mean – it's the time, place, and everything like that comes together. So it's the right timing, it's the right place. And uh, at one point, I mean, I even sat back and said, we don't even need the belts. We're over so much. We didn't need the belts to get over. We got ourselves over. You know, Paul gave us a little bit of rope, and we just made sure that that three-inch rope turned into about five yards of rope. You know what I mean? And that's how we more or less used it. And we got ourselves over. 
You know, if, if we weren't with Raven, we were with somebody else. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we always had managers, the best managers in the business. We always had them. From Missy Hyatt all the way down the line to Terry Reynolds, to you, you name it, we, we've had them. You know, Jason Knight. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to talk about some of those teams you did work quite a bit with, the Bad Breed, Public Enemy, Raven and Richards, the Eliminators, the Gangsters, uh, you know, Superman has Lex Luthor, Batman has the Joker. Who was that for the Pitbulls? Who do you feel that the Pitbulls had the most chemistry with, you know, facing off uh, with one another? Uh, we had great matches with everybody. Uh, Public Enemy, we were very close to those guys. I'm not going to lie. Uh, so having matches with them was really, really, really awesome. Uh, I loved Teddy and Johnny. They were Ted Petty, if you don't really know this, was called the Chief Kid at one time. That's about how way back he goes. I mean, I just started wrestling school in 88, and he was there as the Cheetah Kid. You know, he bought Larry Sharp's business, which was the uh, wrestling ring business, and he would go around and rent the rings out to everybody. And luckily, I started learning with Ted Petty back in the day, you know, and it was very – it was awesome. Uh, but as far as the best – learning experience we ever got was going to New Zealand. Uh, Don Morocco, King Curtis would book us on them shows uh, because of Kevin Sullivan and they just liked us and going to New Zealand and wrestling the British Bulldogs for two weeks was incredible. You know, just, you know, we, it was the British Bulldogs versus the American Pitbulls and we sold out 55,000 stadiums there in New Zealand. It was incredible. We ended up going back four or five more times against the Guerrero brothers, which was Eddie Guerrero's dad and Ray Mysterio's father. Uh, we went back again against Steve Strong and the Guerrero again. Uh, we would always go as heels, which was great. I loved it. And then uh, I think the last time we went was against the Bushwhackers, who were called the Sheep Herders at that point in New Zealand. And they were the face, of course. And like I said, we would get booed out of every building we were in, but we would sell it out, man. We would sell it out. That's really cool to hear. And uh, I heard that the Bushwhackers were very different as the sheep herders back then, a lot more violent. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so the Pitbulls do at some stage leave ECW. And I I mean, I've tried to look on the internet. I don't know if I'm looking in the wrong places. I can't find the reason. What was the reason that um, the Pitbulls left ECW, uh, you know, in, in late uh, 98? We stayed, we were the longest guys staying there. Yeah. Okay? I, I mean, that's the honest opinion. I mean, I was going to leave and join Raven's flock. Really? He had a spot for me at the, in the flock. I had to get knee surgery, though, at that point. So uh, Perry Saturn took my spot there, oh. uh, which gave me a chance to get my knee done talk to my partner, uh, discuss what we want to do. Uh, and then we, and then next thing you know, I got a call from Eric Bischoff. It was Eric Bischoff, uh, Terry Taylor, Raven, Diamond Dallas Page. Uh, and one more guy, by one of the guys. There was like, there was five guys total on the phone. And they asked me, are you ready to come over? And I said, yes, we are. I mean, we, we were the last guys to stick it out with Paul Heyman. And uh, they were giving us a great deal. They were going to bring us in the December pay-per-view versus the Steiner brothers. And they were putting the tag team titles on us. Uh, so we had a great contract, a lot of money. Uh, and I just remember Bischoff saying, you know, come meet me at the Spectrum. We met him at the Spectrum in Philly, had a meeting. Uh, Kevin Sullivan told me, do not do not do a night to night, you know, sign the three year deal. And that's what we wanted to do. And I remember Bischoff that Saturday said, listen, I will be calling you Monday with your flight info. You just have to tell me where do you, you have to move. You either have to, I was living in Philadelphia at the time. So he said, either you got to move to Atlanta, Georgia, or you have to move to Florida. And I said, no problem there. I'll be happy to move to Florida. I didn't want to move to Atlanta at that time. It was just too crowded, too hot for me. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, we gave Paul our notice, which was no problem. I mean, he knew we were going to be leaving. It was just a matter of time. Uh, and then when I got that call on Monday, 
you know, after everything was going on with ECW getting bought out by Vince, I had no idea that WWF was thinking about purchasing WCW. And he did. And that's when uh, Eric Bischoff told me, are you sitting down? I said, yeah. He's like, okay, because I want to make sure you're sitting down when I tell you this, but because he was going to give us $1.5 million for a three-year contract. And uh, he said, I can't sign all new, no new talent. I, can, I cannot sign any new talent. And that was because Vince McMahon told him that. He owns the company now. You know, if I would have signed it a day or two earlier, there would have been no discussion. He would have had to pay me for my three years. And it would have been, even if I sat home, he would still have to pay me. So that pretty much got me pretty sick. Uh, 98, Vince called us back for another spot. They wanted to look at us again, which didn't make sense. Uh, we worked the headbangers. Yeah. And uh, give me five seconds. No worries. Uh, you gotta remind me where I was. Uh, you would work the uh, headbangers on Shotgun Saturday night. Um, yeah, they brought us back for that. Uh, everything went well. I mean, the commentating was great. They were actually putting us over. They were going to put us with Terry Reynolds, uh, bring us in as a tag team. Uh, so I was happy about that. We got home, you know, and I'm waiting. I call Larry Sharp. I said, you hear anything? Do you hear anything? And he's like, no, nah, no. Nah. But then he's like, look, I got a gig in California. If you want to go, it's a ten, it's a seven-day gig for television. You know, you can make some money. I said, I'm going to do that. So we went, flew to California, did that gig, came back. I said, have you heard anything yet? He goes, no. He goes, but I did hear from Australia, uh, Mark Mark Lewin, who was part of uh, the Taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan, and then back in the day, was a promoter in Melbourne, which was called Hardcore Championship Wrestling, uh, who had the Wild Samoans there, the Bruise Brothers, the Headhunters, a bunch of other tag teams. Uh, Nails was the heavyweight champ. Hawk from the Road Warriors was there. We had a lot of talent there. And uh, so I signed a contract with them. I moved to Melbourne and I was there for about 11, almost a year when everything went to shit. And then we had to leave and I was going to live. I was moving there. I was going to move to Melbourne and live there because we were on television every weekend. I was making great money, working four nights a week, flying to Sydney, Brisbane and Adelaide. And then back to uh, Melbourne for TV. So it was, it was an awesome thing. You know, I loved it. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm from Australia and even I didn't know uh, that this company um, from, you know, it, uh, back in that, that time was around. But then again, it was hard to get information on wrestling in Australia, well, at least in my city, Perth, back in those days. Um, so I did want to ask you about uh, in the year 2000, you go back to ECW uh, and you work some house shows, but you only wrestled two more times on TV uh, against Scotty Anton and Rhino. Um, what was this uh, situation about and, and why weren't you kind of there more at the time? What year was that? Uh, in 2000. Yeah, my partner moved to Connecticut at the time. He wasn't wrestling anymore. I was getting back into it again. Uh, I went back and Paul said he'll use me, you know, which I was back in shape because after I broke my neck, you know, I had to come back and I was 100%. So I had great matches with Rhino, great matches with everybody, but I just think Paul was still better because when we left, you know, we were leaving and we were doing a pay-per-view and Taz was calling me every single night before that pay-per-view. And uh, he kept asking me, oh, you know, uh, I don't want you to be mad at me because if it's a two minute match or a 20 minute match, I don't know what it's going to be. And Honestly, at that point, I told Taz, listen, I don't care if it's a two minute match or a half hour match. I'm still getting paid the same. You know, what difference does it make? We're not mad. In my mind, he was nervous and afraid that we were going to kick his ass on live television, which we could have did with no problem because the pit bulls were known as bad motherfuckers. Okay, and that's it, period. You, yeah. you you could try to take us on one at a time, but 
you're not going to be able to take us both. It's just not going to happen. So yeah, we were, you know, we weren't even thinking about doing that to Taz because we were business. But, you know, Taz was the kind of guy that looked, looked to, you know, pick on people and, you know, that kind of stuff. So maybe he felt guilty and maybe he was thinking maybe he was going to get an ass whooping because if we decided to do it, who was going to stop us? Nobody. Nobody could stop us. And we would have did it on live television. So I remember we held the, uh, Paul hostage that night. Like he was like, you go, you going out. And I told him, I said, you know what? I think I changed my mind. And he just looked at me like he was ready to cry, you know? And he's like, what do you mean? I said, well, we're leaving, you know, we're going to WCW. I said, and you know, Taz called me every single night this week, which makes gets me nervous, which is making me nervous now. And then number two, you know, you want me to wait 90 days to get my bonus from the pay-per-view and that's not going to happen. I'm never going to see that money. So I told him was, you're going to pay me for tonight. Like we normally get paid. You're going to pay me for the pay-per-view and you're going to give me my bonus tonight. And that's what you're going to do. And if you don't do it, then me and my partner are not getting dressed and we're not going out there. Or if we do go out there, then we're going to shoot on Taz, whoop his ass, let everybody know that he ain't shit, and ruin that whole gimmick that you have built for years and years and years. And that was kind of what we, you know, put our foot down about, because he owed a lot of people money at that point. He didn't owe us any money. So we didn't want to be those guys that he owed money to. That's all, you know, so. No, I completely understand um okay so uh, you shared a bit of light there on on 2000 and maybe why he didn't bring you in more because he's probably still a bit upset over whatever happened in the past um but how did you feel when you heard that ecw closed down you hear that wcw has been bought how does that make you feel at that time of your career well like i said i knew ecw was was about to happen it wasn't a surprise to me yeah. The surprise to me was uh, WCW. I mean, I lost $1.5 million contract, which we would have signed a, a second one with no problem. We would have did the three years. That would have blew by so fast. We would have signed another three years. Absolutely. And then I would have retired. It would have been the, the end of it, you know, because yeah. I would have saved every dime I had. Uh, so that the WCW one hurt bad, man. Hurt real bad. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so I guess, you know, it gets to this point in time in professional wrestling. Some companies start up here and there. There's one called NWA TNA. I know that you went there and worked on the 2nd of April 2003 against Brian Lee. Uh, was this a tryout? And do you know why nothing came from it? Well, I had originally got called to go there and wrestle AJ Styles. Okay. Okay, so I, like I said, at the time, my partner was in Connecticut. I was in New Jersey. They had yeah. given me a call, and uh, they said, we want you to come in. Uh, Dusty Rhodes actually called me and said, we want you to come in and work against AJ Styles. I said, absolutely, because they saw my matches with Lager, so they knew I would we, we would tear the house down. Uh, I would go 45 minutes with Lager in Japan, and I, every time I wrestled him, we wrestled 45 minutes. So working AJ Styles to me was going to be a night off compared to, you know, Justin Lager. So when I got there, I remember uh, I was getting dressed. You know, I got there kind of early. It was me, Sandman, and Conan. We took the ride. Uh, I've never been there before. Uh, Russo happened to be the boss there at the time, with, and uh, Dusty was a booker. So Dusty came in the locker room and, at that point, I was already pissed off because I found out that AJ didn't want to wrestle me. Oh. So Dusty came in and he's like, what's up, daddy? What's up, baby? You know, what's happening? You know, and I go way back with Dusty because he remembers when we were kids, you know, and, uh, you know, I told him, I said, look, you know, Rusev, R Rusev brought me in. You know, he wanted me to work AJ. I'm here to work AJ. Now, AJ don't want to work. I don't understand why. You know, so, you know, Dusty was like, listen, let me, let me, you know, let me find out, let me look into this and find out what's going on. You know, he goes, don't, don't get up, don't get pissed off, don't get pissed off, because he knew how I was. And uh, he came back and he goes, man, he goes, AJ 
is a, he don't think he could put you in his finish because I was, I guess, my size, you know. But I, we got to remember, we were almost the same height. I was a little taller than him. I mean, I was way bigger than him, but he could have gained me the finish with no problem. I mean, I would have took it with no problem. I don't know if he felt like a little nervous because I did break my neck. And maybe, you know, that was a problem. But, you know, to me, it wasn't a problem. So Dusty told me, look, don't worry about it. It's his loss because you would have made him look good. You know, look at it like this. They want to put you with Brian Lee. And I'm like, I have no, I've worked Brian Lee a million times. I have no problem working Brian Lee. Uh, if that's what you want to do, we'll do it. So I did it. Uh, they aired that, that match five or six times on TV. Okay. After the match, you know, they gave everybody little cards to go get a bite to eat up the street okay and it was called the white trash cafe <laughs> and i'm just like this is so ghetto man like I, I i can't put up with this shit you know what i mean i'm gonna be sitting in this cafe and get shot at or something you know <laughs> so i call my girl up and my girl's like just get your shit and get the fuck out of there you know so i took my girl's advice and i told sandman and coney i didn't even talk to russo i blew him off he, I don't care if he wanted to talk to me. I blew him off. So I don't care whatever he ever says or if anybody from TNA ever said or impact anybody had anything to say. I walked out of that place saying to myself, no, thank you. I do not want to work for you. And I'm not going to be eating at a white trash cafe. <laughs> and it's not going to happen. And I told Sam and them in the car, you know, they're like, you, you coming back? I said, no, absolutely not. I said, you know, don't disrespect me. Have me come there ready to work somebody. And then that guy pulls out and he gets no flack about it. You know what I'm saying? Because he's AJ Styles. I still would have kicked his ass if I wanted to. You know what I'm saying? It didn't make a difference to me, you know, yeah. but I was being a professional and I would have wrestled him and we would have had a great match. But I don't know if it was my reputation. I don't know if it was because he was afraid he may have hurt my neck which I understand a lot of guys feel that way, but I was very, very secure with my injury being healed hundred percent. I was back in the ring as you know, and as well as everybody knows, Rick Rude brought me back against Shane Douglas. to kick his ass. So, you know, it was just dusty trying to get me uh, work and guys weren't working with dusty. They were being, you know, little babies at that point. I think that's when, that generation started acting like little children instead of business okay. guys. You know what I'm saying? I completely understand where you're coming from as it uh, pertains to that. And I just, I'm just thinking to myself, why didn't you, AJ, if he didn't feel comfortable using his finisher on you, then there's other things he could have done to beat you in a match if he's supposed to go over a roll up, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, even a schoolboy would have been fine. I mean, look, like I said, we would, I'm telling you, we would have tore the house down. When once they saw me and him go against each other, they would have kept us. They would have wanted to see a, a, an angle, and I knew that was going to happen, you know. But once they changed their mind, I'm like, you know what? That's your loss because I was in shape. You know what I mean? I had the crowd on my side. I could have got over there. It, it wouldn't have been a problem, you know. But once I seen how they handled business, and uh, it was too ghetto for me. I, I apologize. I mean, that's just. You know, that was me, and I couldn't do it. Sorry. Uh, I completely understand. Um, so I did want to ask you about uh, when you worked for 3PW, because you, you got to be the heavyweight champion of this company at this stage in your career. You're working Terry Funk, you're working Sabu, Kevin Sullivan, Sam and Raven, etc. What was it like at this point of your career, getting to be like the guy in the company, you're the main event, you're closing the shows. Was that a welcome challenge for you at that point in your career? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I was never a fond of holding the, tele, the, the heavyweight title for any company, unless we were a tag team. Uh, that's a rough job. You know, it's not an easy job becoming the champion. You know, so I happen to be on the booking committee of 3PW. Uh, the owner of the company wanted to put the strap on me. I what am I going to do? You know what I mean? I didn't want to argue about it. I said, okay, we'll do it. You know what I mean? If it gets my paydays in. And then I got a chance to work all the veterans, which I loved. 
and they were all friends of mine and uh it was a pleasure you know uh one of one of those nights i remember working sandman and my girl happened to valet me she kicked the living shit out of sandman in that ring man it was <laughs> awesome i never forgot it he was in the ring going ah, ooh, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, you know because she didn't know really the business and she was laying in the kicks man like it was going out of style and uh that was really funny uh but yeah, I love 3PW. That was just, it's just a different company. And Pro Wrestling Unplugged was another one that I happened to be a part of because my students that I had three professional wrestling schools called the Animal House. And uh, a lot of my students opened up their own school and their own company. Even though they were working for Combat Zone, they still wanted to own their own thing. And that was fine with me because they used me and it was awesome. Excellent, Gary. Um, I wanted to kind of take it from 3PW, bring it all the way up to today. Uh, from my research, it says between 2022 and right now, you've worked 11 matches. So you've been, you've been keeping busy. You might have wrestled more, but the internet just might not have the information for me. Um, what would the ideal scenario be for you to, to have your final match eventually? right now i've been so like this month i've been working thursday friday saturday every week this month i've wrestled what 12 times already this month you know what i'm saying so my right. career is way way not even close to being in order i i just signed a deal with championship wrestling florida which is the new florida championship wrestling that's going to be aired on television so i just started with them uh two weeks ago we did our six tv tapings for the first time on a Saturday and Sunday. Uh, I'm working almost every weekend now. I'm staying very busy. Uh, if it's not a signing, it's a wrestling match. And like I said, with Florida Championship Wrestling kicked in, that's giving me TV time again, which should break, which should raise my rate and give me more dates to wrestle. So I'm 56 years old. I'm not even thinking about retiring yet. <laughs> hasn't even come across my mind that is awesome to hear i really like hearing that you still got a lot left in the tank pitbull gary wolf i really appreciate your time on the show here um one more thing though we got to get through is the final segment of this show where we find out about your favorite things in life the first three are about wrestling the rest are about some other different subjects uh gary who would you say will be your favorite professional wrestler of all time <laughs> Uh, of all time, probably be superstar Billy Graham, uh, Mill Mascaris, Bruno San Martino, of course. I had a few guys that I, I mean, I loved superstar back in the day when I was a kid. He was just, he was just so big and I was a little kid watching wrestling with my grandpa, you know what I mean? Wanted to be a wrestler, but never thought it would be possible because of so the size of those guys back in them days, but they were all monsters, you know? Okay. Excellent choices there though. Um, if you could pick one opponent or maybe a tag team opponent or, you know, just your favorite opponent that you had in your time so far in professional wrestling. Uh... I, we used to love wrestling Public Enemy and we used to love wrestling the Eliminators because we would just click so well with each other. Uh, the difference between the Pitbulls and other tag teams is we were able to adapt to everybody's style. So it could be strong style, lucha libre. It didn't matter. We were able to adapt to anybody's style. Uh, I will give you one fact. The Pitbulls were the first tag team that Rey Mysterio and Juventud Guerrero ever wrestled in the United States. Okay, we were the first tag team that they, they came over with Conan. I remember Paul Heyman said, you're wrestling them two luchadors. I remember turning my head, looking at them, looking back at Paul, going, that kid looks like he's 11 years old. <laughs> Cause they didn't have their masks on yet, you know, and he's like, Oh, don't worry about it, you'll talk to Conan. And they put masks on Lucha Libre masks, and they're very good. And we wrestle had an unbelievable match because they are and they were and they still are to this day amazing workers. And that just showed us that you know, hey, we can adapt to their style as well. And we were able to do that, awesome. it was awesome. 
Yeah, I never knew that you got to work those two guys. That's really cool. Um, the next one on the list here is: uh, do you, Is there one match, uh, your favorite match that you of, of your whole career that you can think of? If someone asked you, Gary, you know, show me what it is that you do or have done for your life, what what match would you show them? I would show the nineteen ninety five two out of three falls. Dog double dog collar match uh, with Raven and Stevie Richards versus the Pitbulls. It was ranked number one at the arena. It was ranked number two worldwide. The only match that beat us that year was Razor Ramon and Heartbreak Kids uh, Shawn Michaels ladder match. It was number one. We were number two. Wow. Okay, that's cool. Excellent stuff. Um, moving away from wrestling now, Gary, do you have a favorite book? Book. <laughs> uh, the tell the TV guide is my favorite book. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, that brings me to my next one. Favorite TV show. Uh, two and a half men, of course. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, what would you say is your favorite film? Uh, Snatch with Brad Pitt. Oh, Excellent choice. Excellent. Um, favorite musical artist or band? Metallica, Rob Zombie. I could sit here, Judas Priest. I'll sit here for an hour telling you my favorite bands. <laughs> but Rob Zombie, I like very much so because when I met him, he was, he was called White Zombie, the right. band still. And uh, I had to ask him if I could use his music. And uh, he was very, very cool, man. He didn't want no contract, didn't want no money. He just sat down with us in the back of the concert, you know, afterwards. And we did a shot of Jack Daniels. And he's <laughs> like, signed and delivered, man. Contract is made. He goes, if you could put me on television once a week and I could hear my music, I love that idea. And, uh, you know, where Metallica you know, wanted to charge Vince McMahon a million dollars to use Enter Sandman for <laughs> Sandman, you know. So for uh, Rob Zombie to be very humble, I have never forgotten that. You know what I mean? He could have been a total dickhead, but he wasn't. He was a very humble guy and very cool. And uh, he let me use his music and never bitched about it. That is awesome. And I'd have to say, I think you and I are very similar when it comes to our music tastes. So very good stuff, Gary. Um, the next one, moving away from the arts, favorite food. Oh, favorite food. Got to be Italian. I am Italian, half Italian. So I love my food. Honestly, my girl, she couldn't boil water when I met her. Now she's the best, best chef cook you could think of. I, uh, Believe me, I don't care if it's from a dessert to a main course. She can cook her ass off, man. And I eat everything she makes. <laughs> so I love it. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, we've only got four more to go here, Gary. Do you have a favorite place to eat on the road? Yes. Uh, I love the Waffle House. I love uh, Cracker Barrel, especially when we're on the road. Uh yeah, I, I, and, and it's hard. I mean, a lot of a lot of the guys know this. I mean, it's hard to eat healthy and clean when you're on the road. So now that I'm a lot older, uh, you know, I realize it's a very important thing to do. So now when I'm on the road nowadays, you know, back in the day, it was more partying than anything. Now it's like, okay, I got to keep eating. <laughs> and I got to not only eat good, I got to eat clean because the older you get, the harder it is to stay healthy. So Good I did learn that. That's cool, Gary. And, uh, you know, the, the, I think those two are probably the most popular answers on the show for that question. Uh, next one, a uh, favorite alcoholic beverage. Well, I used to drink a lot back in the day. And Jack Daniels, I pretty much had an IV and Jack connected <laughs> to me all the time. Uh but that stuff made me a very mean person. <laughs> uh, did enough drinking, probably to last a lifetime. Uh, I don't really drink much anymore. I'm not really into it. it, it it's To me, it's very nasty. I don't like sloppy drunks. It, it's the biggest turnoff in my life, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, 
So uh, I, I quit okay. drinking. I haven't drank. And plus, you know, with sugar being in so much alcohol nowadays, and I watch my sugar intake, you know, I don't like to drink too much. If I did have to drink anything, it would be something that had no sugar in it. And it wouldn't be something where I would drink all night because I'm a cannabis man. Uh, wow. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I wake up and I feel great. You know, when I remember waking up drinking and feeling like shit. You know, so I don't, I'm not into that no more. I don't feel like doing that no more. So drinking to me is not interested. Fair enough. Gary, uh, second last one here. Uh, favorite female body part. You see a good looking lady, you know, where will, where will your eyes go to first? I would say her legs, her ass. And then I would go to her face. <laughs> very nice that's very nice so uh, I, I always like to let people know this uh, mr don morocco told me that he uh he's an ass man so i think that's oh crazy. don morocco's the man let me tell you a quick story real fast about don morocco sure. he took care of us man our first trip to new zealand you know we were marks and green as grass you know we got to work against the british bulldogs and when we got to New Zealand, what did we do? We got on the phone calling every person we know in the United States to break their stones, just, you know, to break their balls, to say, look, we're in New Zealand, the opposite side of the world. Kiss my ass. You know, I'm working the British Bulldogs with Don Morocco and all these big names. And I said, you know, we're having a blast. And one night I remember hearing Don Morocco walking down the hotel hall screaming, you fucking pit bulls, fucking every bitch from sea to shining sea, making all these calls. And when he said making all these calls, my eyebrows like went, what? You know, and I'm like, oh, shit. So he banged on our door. We opened the door and we got a bunch of girls in our room and mattresses are all over the room. My partner shoved one of the mattresses in the bathroom. It was insanity. And he just looked at us and said, you fucking guys. He goes, you got a fucking nine hundred and fifty four dollar phone bill. And we're looking at each other and we didn't have two pennies to piss in, not a little pot. You know what I'm saying? And we looked at him like, oh, shit. Like we had no idea it was going to cost like that kind of money. And he's like, listen, this is your first ever trip out of the country. I'm going to let it slide. I, me, Don Morocco will pay your bill. But if it happens again, I will kick your ass. <laughs> and he made it very clear. And he was nice enough. And he's such a great guy that he paid our phone bill. Uh, and then if you look into history, you will find out that was me and my partner's gimmick. We would do that to rib all the boys. I don't care who you were from Robert Fuller to Matt Bourne to Ricky Steamboat. Yeah, even Pops, Big Vader. We would sneak in their rooms and make our long distance calls. And every time, I mean, some guys would catch us, some guys wouldn't. But Robert Fuller was one of them guys that caught us. And he said, I got to go to the front desk at the hotel for something. And I remember he left me, my partner, and Matt Bourne in the room. And Matt Bourne looked at us and said, are you guys pulling that phone crank again? And I said, yes, we are. And he's like, oh, shit. If Robert comes around that corner and his face is red, that means he's pissed and he's going to have to pay that bill or you guys are going to have to pay that bill. And he turned that corner and his face was red and Matt Bourne, he goes, look, there's only one way out of this. When he opens the door, let's start fighting and let him think we're really <laughs> fighting for real. And that's what we did because when, when he opened the door, he was ready to yell at us. And then all of a sudden he's like, oh my God, I got to break this fight up. <laughs> and it did make him forget about the phone bill for about 10 or 15 seconds but once we broke up the fight he looked at us and said you motherfuckers you know what i mean you gotta pay my phone bill and of course we paid it because we were in the stud stable we were just so happy to be part of that click yeah that's great well thank you so much for the story there that's really cool and that's actually made my face hurt from uh, laughing so much then uh gary the last one for here for the favorite things is uh your favorite curse word well, every other fucking word I say is fuck. So pretty much fuck is my favorite word. You know, who gives a fuck? What the fuck? How the fuck? How the fuck you been? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm, I'm like a fucking uh, mafia movie, but I'm walking around. 
a walking mafia script. <laughs> if I say I'm going to fuck you up, I'm going to fuck you up. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> Excellent stuff. So Pitbull Gary Wolf has been such a joy for me to have the opportunity to talk to you here today, learn about your career uh, and, and find out some of these stories uh, from your time, your life. You, you should be so proud of how much you've accomplished in your time in professional wrestling. And I always say this to guests that I have on the show that I've been a fan of since I was young. Um, you, you managed to make a fan in the most isolated city in the world, all the way over here in Perth, Western Australia. So I think to reach that far really means a lot. And I just want to let you know that I appreciate everything that you've put into the wrestling business. Listen, I appreciate you. I love your country. I loved living in Australia. I loved visiting New Zealand. Uh, seven to one women. I mean, bro, <laughs> I was living in the lab, brother. I'd walk into a strip joint and walk out with three or four girls, man, every single time. Like I said, when I was in Australia many times, you want a real man, you come and see the pit bulls and we'll be at this nightclub and no bullshit, thousands of girls would show up at that nightclub. It was awesome. Seven to one. I can't <laughs> wait to go back and visit Australia again. Hopefully somebody will see this. That's a promoter. I held those tag team titles in Australia for years. Okay. You want to bring the pit bull back? I'll be happy to come back and I will destroy everything in sight, including <laughs> women. <laughs> well, thank you again, Pitbull Gary. We'll really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And you're a very, very, you stay on top of me, brother. And that's why I'm doing this interview with you because you don't give up. And I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Gary. And thank all of you out there for joining me here for the Insider's Edge podcast here on the WWE Network. I'm California. This is my new friend, Pitbull Gary Wolf. And we will see you down the road. Thank you. Peace out, Pitbull out. Network, that's the way we blind. Get puppies. Hey, network, that's the way we blind. Get all of has been paid for by the WZWA Network.